We gather as the people of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And, and with, with your spirit. spirit. I'd like to welcome all family and friends, especially cousins and the O'Connors, especially from Sydney and others who have gathered with us today. I'd like to acknowledge my Jesuit brothers who are with us today for this celebration. I'd like to acknowledge also those who are celebrating with me. Father Des Dwyer, the parish priest of this church. Father Chris Wilcock, our liturgist and composer and who is our homilist today. Father Michael Head, who's the acting superior of the Campion community. And Father Robin Koning, who is my socius and keeps me in line. It's a great opportunity with family and friends to acknowledge one who has been a great teacher of many of us, myself included. And we acknowledge John's great contribution to philosophy, to teaching, to the church and to culture. We acknowledge also his great dedication as a Jesuit for more than 60 years as a Jesuit and in the company with us. So we acknowledge him today, we commend him to the Lord we pray the Lord to carry him with the angels to his eternal rest and peace. And so we bow our heads and pray. In baptism, John was given a share in the death and resurrection of Christ. As we gather today to celebrate the mystery of our faith, we greet the body of our brother and pray that he will feast forever at the eternal banquet table of heaven through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. We begin by blessing John once again with the waters of baptism, reminding us and him that as he died with Christ, we pray that he will rise with, the, with Christ in heaven. Now invite Steve Sin to come forward to place the pall on his coffin. A reminder of the garment of baptism that was placed on him when he was first baptised. And Father Steve Sin and a member of John's family, Donna Lowry, will place a number of other symbols on the coffin. John had a great love for his family, particularly his parents, Frank and Olive, and his sister, Sister Mona. He wrote up many private accounts of the family story. Symbolising these family relationships, a collection of reflections on his father, Frank Copan, will be placed. John also had a great love for the family of the Society of Jesus, which he joined 71 years ago. He made a number of studies of the Jesuits and their ministries. One of these embraced also his love for order and statistics, a database on everyone who joined the Jesuits and worked in Australia. For 50 years, John taught philosophy, uh, much of that time in the Ecumenical United Faculty of Theology, Later in life, he edited many of his class notes on personalism, on the problem of evil, and on love for publication in the series Marquette Studies in Philosophy. His book on love will be placed on the coffin. Alongside his academic work, John was very committed to the sacramental aspect of his 58 years of priestly life, celebrating many weddings and baptisms, and supplying in various parishes especially Our Lady of Victories in Camberwell and St. Canice's in King's Cross. And so the chalice and pattern, symbols of priesthood, will be placed. The breviary, the prayer of the church, represents John's commitment to his own prayer life. This too will be placed on his coffin.
For John, the innovative work of Taya de Chardin represented the creative future of the Catholic Church. A few years ago, he collected various pieces he had written about Tyard's life and work into a, bit, into a biography. This was John's last publication and serves as a symbol of his lifetime of academic work in the church. As we gaze upon this coffin, as we come to farewell, John, and the symbols reminding us of the richness of his life as we give thanks for him, we pray. Lord, you gave John, your servant and priest, the privilege of a holy ministry in this world. May he rejoice forever in the glory of your kingdom. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Uh, my name is Mark O'Connor, a uh, family member. Uh, the relationship to John will be explained as I read through this eulogy. Uh, John was born in 1927 to Frank and Olive Coburn, who were then school teachers in uh, country New South Wales. And, the, and John's sister, Mona, was born four years later, in about 1932, in Goulburn. Unfortunately, um, after Mona's birth, Olive didn't do very well and she died of infection about 10 days later. Um, about a year later, uh, Frank, her father, their father, married my grandfather's sister, Bridget, and that's how the O'Connor connection came connected with the Coburns. Uh, as a, as a child, I didn't know a great lot about John. Uh, of course, he was based here in Melbourne most of the time. Um, but he's, certainly his parents, Frank and Bid, and I'll call Bid his mother because I didn't know any different. And um, they became sort of uh, regular uh, visitors to uh, our farm at Oxford Park in Harden. And uh, we saw quite a bit of them over the years. Um, the main thing John was responsible for, I suppose, for us was uh, we all went to Riverview Jesuit School in Sydney. Uh, at the time, uh, my father and my uncle were considering sending us to St Pat's in Goulburn, but then thought a Sydney school would be more appropriate, and because of John's influence, we all went to Riverview, rather than that other great Catholic school in Sydney that was our chief rival. Um, I was the first of five, two brothers and five cousins who attended Riverview, and from then on, um, 12 of the next generation of various nephews of mine and cousins' children went. 12 have gone through and there's still uh, two or three to start. So there's quite a number gone through Riverview. Um, I started in 1968, found Riverview a daunting place after a small Catholic school in Harden. I was in year seven, 12 years of age. But one of the things I found was that um, John's parents, Frank and Bid, had retired uh, and moved to Sydney and they bought a house 500 yards from the front gate of Riverview. So I used to go there regularly on a Sunday afternoon um, to see them and being traditional old English couple they always had high tea and certainly the food there was better than what it was at school. Um, Frank was a great organist too so I was learning the piano so I always had a session on the organ. Um, We never saw a great deal of John through his lifetime. He used to come up to the farm about every couple of years. Um, we saw even less of his sister, Mona, because for a long time the Brigidine Order of Nuns that Mona belonged to. And by the way, Mona only passed away about six months ago in Sydney. And she was a Brigidine nun and certainly um, in the early days she was uh, very restricted in what she could do. Um, 1985, I married my wife, Julie who's unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago from cancer. Um, that was a bit of an unusual wedding in itself and was in the Uniting Church, but John was there and gave a blessing. Certainly if it was in the Catholic Church, he would have done the ceremony. Um, we had a major family reunion a few months later in 1985 and John and Mona came. By this time his parents had passed away, of course, in the uh, 80s. And it was certainly a great event. 
And uh, since then, like, I haven't seen a great deal of John, but I know his influence on our lives, and I just hope, and it's, being a priest, of course, is a huge commitment. Uh, being a religious is a huge commitment. And I'm sure John is in the right place now, and God is looking after him for us. Thank you. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. I think that we suffer in this life can never be compared to the glory as yet unrevealed, which is waiting for us. The whole creation is eagerly waiting for God to reveal his children. It was not for any fault on the part of creation that it was made unable to attain this purpose. It was made so by God. But creation still retains the hope of being free like us, from its slavery to decadence, to enjoy the same freedom and glory as the children of God. From the beginning to now, the entire creation as we know has been groaning in one great act of giving birth. And not only creation, but all of us who possess the first fruits of the Spirit, we too groan inwardly as we wait for our bodies to be set free. For we must be content to hope that we shall be saved. Our salvation is not in sight. We should not have to be hoping for it if it were. But as I say, we must hope to be saved since we are not saved yet. It is something we must wait for with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, I tell you most solemnly, unless a man is born again through water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be surprised when I say, you must be born from above. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. That is how it is with all who are born of the Spirit. How can that be possible? asked Nicodemus. You, a teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things, replied Jesus. I tell you most solemnly, we speak only about what we know and witness only to what we have seen. And yet, you people reject our evidence. If you do not believe me when I speak about things of this world, how are you going to believe me when I speak to you about heavenly things? For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost but may have eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. For John Coburn, as I suspect is true for all of us, there is no easy access. There is no single gateway that leads to a fairly complete understanding of the man. Most of us have a collection of memories built on the experience of our encounters with John. These may be many or few, directly personal or by way of his writings. Let me cast two pebbles into the pond and see where the ripples take us. Firstly, one word among several that I would employ to describe John is enthusiast. He was a man of decided enthusiasms, matched often by decided interest-free zones. The art and thought of continental Europe and North America were central to his enthusiasms. 
Among these should be counted the philosophy of personalism, his investigations into the subjects of love, the problem of evil, God's knowledge and foreknowledge, and many others besides. Culturally, he could be described as a romantic and a modernist. I never heard him offer this quotation, but the early German romantic poet, Novalis, said, to philosophize is to make vivid. That could almost stand as John Coburn's motto. As a teacher and a writer, he brought to one's understanding of our world, both inner and outer, brought it to a more vivid clarity. He would use any example, no matter how ordinary or seemingly unpromising, to illustrate his point. Many of his students will recall how he would wave a fountain pen in the air to point up the difference between any pen as simply belonging to the family or the genre of pens and this pen which has an identity tied to its belonging to him, the owner. In spite of some striking, as I call them, interest-free zones in John's life, sport, though of course I accept skiing here, animals, even food. The range of his enthusiasms was nevertheless wide. So now let me cast my second pebble into the pond. And the word here is word, the word word itself. And word in its various manifestations, the written word, the sung word, and the song without words. This second pebble is a twin to the first, since these manifestations are also tied to his enthusiasms. Undeveloped examples for the moment will have to serve the larger purpose here. Please forgive me. But the written word first. A writer he knew thoroughly and to whom he responded, though not without criticism, was the Algerian-born Frenchman Albert Camus, the author of The Outsider, The Plague, The Rebel, explored many of the philosophical enthusiasms which had also captured John. And for his own part, John was a scrupulous, even fastidious, crafter of his own words. Precision in presentation, clarity in expression. These were his bywords. His devotion to the weekly magazine, The New Yorker, with its thoughtful essays and highly professional layout is easy to understand. On this matter, one should add that it was not simply the New Yorker's articles and reviews that he devoured, but also its cartoons. From the many that he shared with me, let me choose this dictum from among them. There is no such thing as new money, but old money that got away. A second manifestation of the word for John was the sung word. John's father, as we heard, was an organist but also a singer, and he passed on 
if not a singing voice, but certainly a love of song to his son. For John, at the pinnacle of that cultural form, stands Franz Schubert. And of Schubert's more than 600 songs, stands Winterreise, or Winter Journey. John was not unique in that enthusiasm. It's one that I and many other lovers of Lieder share. But also within the category of the sung word, let me simply add the world of opera, especially the Da Ponte operas of Mozart and Richard Strauss's Der Rosenkavalier, among so many other examples. John was a keen lover and sometimes a stern critic of artists who brought these works to life. Now the third manifestation of the word is the curiously named song without words, namely music that has no verbal text, but which has a non-literal substratum contributing to the musical structure of a piece. Here one could tick off galleries of composers. The symphonies of John's beloved Mahler and Bruckner, the string quartets of Haydn, the cello suites of J.S. Bach, as well as the instrumental works of the aforementioned Mozart and Schubert. John's knowledge of these classics was deep and enduring. I was not aware of John being a student of the visual arts, of painting and sculpture, but of film, he was more than a keen student of favorite actors and directors. He could almost be described as a groupie of Fellini and Ingmar Bergman, for example. Now I'm conscious of skating at perilously high speed over a terrain that deserves much closer attention than I'm giving it here. But a grave injustice would be done to John if I failed to record a capital enthusiasm of his, namely his deep commitment to the pastoral aspects of his priesthood. This may be exemplified by his willingness to relieve parish priests of their duties to allow them to take holidays, or in several cases where he served for longer periods as a locum. It was also demonstrated in the care he took in preparing couples for marriage, couples who otherwise found it difficult to find a priest to negotiate some of the formalities and legalities of that sacrament. John was the least clerical priest, but among the most pastorally sensitive. This leads me back to the two scripture readings that we heard earlier today. The passage from Paul's letter to the Romans with its striking image of the birth pangs of creation and of ourselves as we struggle towards redemption. These were areas in which the French Jesuit and paleontologist Pierre Chardin, Thierry de Chardin, in which he labored, but not always without pain. Thierry's work and writings on the evolution of creation held a steady fascination for John, blending as it did the natural science of geology, of anthropology, with the theology of creation and redemption. It's a vast canvas. And then the nocturnal meeting between Jesus and Nicodemus in John's Gospel. This passage holds both mystery, being born again, and freedom, the wind blowing where it wills. 
John Coburn's own life and work sought to bring clarity where it could be brought, yet with a liberty and an untrammeled mind that was shaped by the cultural markers of our civilization and leavened by a dash of humor and mischief. As a man, as a priest, John persevered in his pursuit of what he believed contributed to the enhancement of the person and to its clear-headed expression. A man of vivid enthusiasms. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Chris. Let us pause for a moment and just reflect on Chris's words and the word we heard. Let us stand and offer our prayers. And for those who are leading us in these prayers, if they could come forward. We come together now to offer our prayers of thanks for the life of Father John Coburn and for the blessings he has brought into the lives of so many people. We pray for our Pope Francis and our Bishop Dennis and the whole Catholic Church, which John served and loved throughout his ministry and life. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. John had a great attachment to his family and friends. We pray in thanks for the love he gave to them and they gave to him. We ask God to be with them all at this time of loss. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our John worked for, loved and served the Society of Jesus in many different roles. In appreciation for John's lifetime of work, we pray that Jesuits might continue in the ministries John so loved. Lord, hear us. In the early life, John taught in St. Patrick's College in Melbourne and St. Ignatius in Norwood. Some old boys still remember him with affection and we pray in thanks for this ministry there. Lord, hear us. For much of his ministry, John worked in the United Faculty of Theology and had a strong sense of ecumenism. We pray in thanks for the men and women who worked with John in that faculty, for the great work they did, and in hope that John's commitment to ecumenism may continue amongst them today. Lord, hear us. For the last few years of his life, John has been in need of significant care. We pray in thanks for the staff of Mary MacKillop Aged Care Facility, the staff of Campion House, and the many people who came to spend time with him. Lord, hear us. Almighty God, hear our prayers as we say farewell to Father John Coburn. May your grace keep our memories and affections of John alive into the future. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us pray, my sisters and brothers, that this, our offering, may be acceptable to our almighty God. O powerful God, by this Eucharist may John, your servant and priest, rejoice forever in the vision of the mysteries which he faithfully ministered here on earth. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended, and when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognising the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with by his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your, with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, with Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. 
be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope and Dennis our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant John, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he, who was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection, when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give them admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, where you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all ages and praise you without end. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on this world all that is good. For through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours, forever and ever. Amen. And so we pray with confidence as Jesus encouraged us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now. We pray for peace, peace for our brother John, peace for family and friends, and for all of us at this time. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let's wish each other the Lord's peace. Michael, well done. Well done. Thank you. Lamb of God, you take, take away the sins, sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are we called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
body of Christ. The 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 body of Christ. Amen. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Amen. Before our final commendation, I'd simply like just to offer a few words. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and particularly my brother Jesuits, but also those who have come from interstate, especially the O'Connor family. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you, Mark, for your words, and Chris for the homily. Thank you for our musicians that continue to help us in these moments. Thank you. I want to all acknowledge, as we did in the prayers, the MacKillop Age facility, which took John into care some time ago and very tenderly and carefully looked after him. I want to thank MacKillop for all they did for him and they continue to do for us. I want to also thank the camping community, the nurses, some of who are represented here today, but also the community at Campion, especially those who went regularly to visit John and encourage him to continue conversations around things that meant most to him. For reasons beyond our control, the burial cannot take place today after the service. It will be on Wednesday at 12 o'clock at Melbourne General Cemetery. But we will gather in the parish hall afterwards for a cup of tea where we hope to continue conversations and gratitude for John's life. We hope you can join us there. We now go to the final commendation of John.
Let us stand. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. And I invite members of the family if they'd like to come forward and offer a final blessing to John. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother John in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. Merciful Lord, turn towards us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurance of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. In Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.